So it seems like everyone who wants a seat has one. Uh, I hope you know who I am. I've spoken here before, spoken lots of places. Um, helped to run C++ North in Toronto, quite a long way south from here. Um, and uh, one of the people who helped to found includes C++. And it's been almost 45 years that people have been paying me to program. And in that time, I've, I've been an employee, I've been an employer, and I've worked on lots and lots of projects. I had a tendency to be brought in and to projects that are in trouble and, uh, and fix them and rescue them. And so I thought I would share with you some things I've learned over that time uh, that aren't about commas and semicolons, but are about people and especially about yourself. So there's this metaphor it's a pretty good one, of things as a journey. Life as a journey, or your career, or a relationship, or even a project. And it's not a bad metaphor, you know? Sometimes the path is pretty smooth, it's easy to see where to go. Other times it's very steep and it's difficult, physical. And any journey like this is going to be easier if you have, well, maybe some company, but also some other things. So just speaking very practically, maybe a compass. A map, this is the Toronto subway system, not all journeys are hikes. Uh, a walking stick, uh, some kind of like overview, you don't need a detailed map, or maybe you know, directions right at the moment that you need them. And these are, are very tangible things. If you're going on a hike, you could touch them. But you might also have some less tangible things that you wanted to take, and especially on a metaphorical journey, that's super important. So a kind of guiding star. Not as precise and accurate as something that says turn left for the waterfall, but just more like, you, yeah, I want to go roughly north, and that's that star up there, and I, I'm going, well, more north than anything else, right? Uh, a touchstone or a talisman, something that physically reminds you about what's important to you and keeps you centered about what you're trying to achieve. Some kind of mechanism for making choices and making decisions. And that's the sort of things I want to talk about here. So that's what I think wisdom really is. A lot of what we have to do is make decisions. And there's lots of ways to be better at decisions. One is that you just do it faster. You don't spend forever agonizing about which to do. You analyze the situation, say this is what we're going to do, then you do it. Uh, maybe it would matter to you whether your decisions worked or not. I decided to do this and it was terrible. I decided to do this and it was great, so better outcomes. Or maybe it's that you're not constantly going back over afterwards saying, oh, if only I had put one more person on this, or if only I had insisted that we do that other thing. You define better. It's better for you personally, better for your project, better for your career. These possible definitions of, of better, the answer is yes. Whatever you think would make you make better decisions. But it's not just about deciding what to do. Sometimes when things are really tough, if you have a catchphrase or a mantra that you come back to, it's like that touchstone that says, I can do this, I can keep going, even though it's hard. I used to tell my staff all the time, if it was easy, anyone could do it. It's not a bad point. Things you can do that will make you more effective for your definition of effective. Uh, I don't want to make a bunch of really useful engines who make money for their employers. Uh, it's good for me to make people who are maybe happy, who like their careers, who go home on time, who are raising their children, that kind of thing. Because I've learned things over all these decades, and I've learned them one of a few pretty much unavoidable ways. The number one way to learn things is by being wrong. Right? You do something wrong and you realize that was wrong and you know it would have been better if I did this other thing. Now, I think I've learned a lot over 40 plus years, but not everybody does. Right? You know that person? They, just have this, they don't have 10 years of experience, they just have the same year of experience 10 times. Uh, I, I knew a guy who told me once, I'm not really 36, I'm 18 with 18 years experience, which was true about him. Sometimes you're lucky enough to do something right, so you don't have to make a mistake to get the lesson, but you do have to notice that it was right, 
And many people just assume that doors are going to open and hurdles are going to fall and things are going to work out and every, the other side's going to understand. And so when stuff does work out, you don't always notice like, ooh, I did a really cool thing there. And then try to deduce what the rule is so that, you know, if I get this opportunity again, I have to remember that really cool thing sometimes works very powerfully well. It's rare, not because we rarely do anything right, but because we don't often notice that we're actually doing something right and there's a lesson in it. Have you ever heard the phrase, he was born on third base and thinks he hit a triple? People who've had very easy lives, who have all the hurdles removed for them, tend not to have a lot of wisdom because they haven't really had to overcome difficulty. But the quickest way to learn super cool techniques, mantras, guidelines, heuristics, is to have someone tell it to you and to believe them. And that's what I'm offering today. Um, these are not like the one weird trick that will save your marriage or anything. Like, you probably heard a lot of this stuff before. Some of these things are things that we teach people when they're four and five years old. But if you have heard them and yet are not doing them, why is that? Sometimes the reason people don't want to do things is because, like, well, that's obvious. That's simple. Everyone knows that, sure. Doesn't mean it's wrong. Doesn't mean doing it wouldn't help. It probably could. So I'm going to give you a pair of contradictory advice. The first piece of contradictory advice is try trusting me on some of these stuff. Try doing some of this stuff and see if it makes things better. The immediate contradiction is it, that might not actually be good. <laughs> so this talk, the very first time I tried to give it was over two hours long before I made myself stop. Um, I have made it shorter. There are less slides, but there's so much that I didn't include that I could have. So you need to be able to be ready to add more. And some of these things might not apply to you or might not be right for you. Uh, I would distinguish between an example not working for you and a principle not applying to you. So if I tell you about a principle and then I give you an example involving small children and you're like, well, I don't have children, it's like, fine, but the principle may still apply. Maybe you don't have employees or maybe you don't have a boss, that's fine. The principle may apply even if the example doesn't. The real key to me is start building like a store of wisdom. Things that you learned yourself and noticed but you never actually brought up and surfaced or things that other people have told you. And then as you build up this store of wisdom, you will, you know, be a wiser person. So with that background out of the way, I wanted to present you some guiding stars, some things that I think make a difference. And they're not really in an order except I'm going to start with the one I think is probably the biggest, the most important. This to me is what sets seasoned senior developers apart from juniors who are just beginning. Seasoned senior developers believe that whatever they're trying to do should work. They've, they've either had an idea that seems plausible or they've been assigned a task. Either way, they think this should be feasible. The junior tries one thing and says, oh, I give up. This probably isn't even possible. That the documentation isn't right about the API, so pff, what can you do? And the more seasoned person says, we, we're going to find a way to make this work. You know? Okay, we have to email someone. We have to, we have to go ask on, this, on the Slack or the Discord. We have to do something. You probably all know a try it now person. Like if you're working on something physical, right? A small engine that won't start. <laughs> Doesn't start. So they, they tighten something and they say, try it now. <laughs> Doesn't start. Hmm. They loosen something, maybe the same thing. Try it now. And then turn it upside down. Try it now. Uh, let's take it outside where it's warmer. Try it now. And the thing about the try it now person is, a lot of the time it ends up working because they believe it should work. And if they just tighten and loosen and jiggle and fill and empty and... Do you remember taking video game cartridges out and blowing on them and putting them back in again? Like, I don't know if that ever did anything physically, but afterwards it would load. My father used to say, if all else fails, read the instructions. <laughs> I don't like to read the instructions first. I'm married to someone who does, but I don't like to. I don't have a place or context to put all that information until I get started. 
That's fine, nothing wrong with starting without reading the instructions, but if you're lost, if you're stuck, now would be a good time to remember that there are instructions. So maybe there's some stupid wiki that you didn't look at because wikis are stupid, but now that you're stuck, maybe you could go look at that. Uh, people come on the Include Discord and they ask for help, which they get, but a lot of times their initial request for help is like 400 lines of code. Can you tell me what's wrong with this? No. <laughs> No, I really can't. Uh, do you try compiling it? Yes, some sort of error. Okay, maybe if you shared the error with us, we could become enlightened together, right? So reading the error message, reading the instructions. If you believe it can be done, you'll go. You believe the error message might help you because you believe this code should compile, so you're going to see what the compiler's problem is. I did a talk last year called Am I a Good Programmer? And I talked a lot about imposter syndrome. And I pointed out when you're doing things you don't know how to do, it doesn't mean you're an imposter. It means you're a learner. You're learning how to do that thing. Or you could say, I don't know how to do it yet. When you believe things should work, you keep coming at them another way. You try another search. You see if there's someone you can ask. You will end up making it work. So remember that when you're trying to do something and you're stuck. Tell yourself, this should work, and have another go at it. A really, really important set of skills is to be able to observe things and then later to recall them. And most of our memories are not perfect, so that probably means that you actually have a record of them in some sort of electronic form that you could actually search. And observe could mean look, it could mean listen, it could mean noticing what isn't said as much as what is said. It certainly means noticing body language and tone of voice as well as actual words. It means reading what's on the screen, looking at the output, reading the error message. Uh, the number of people who just dismiss things, and then I say, oh, what did that say? And then, I don't know, some sort of error. Like, we're here to solve the error? Maybe we could look at the error? Observing and being able to recall. So I'm gonna give you two specific subsets of this. Taking notes in meetings. And meetings can mean four people around a table but it can also mean an extended email chain, uh, a phone call, a Zoom call, heaven help us, uh, a long uh, Slack, Discord, whatever thing that rattled on for a couple of days, taking notes in a separate place that summarizes that thing. The first reason for doing so is that even if you never look at them again, just taking notes increases your memory of what happened. That's an easy thing to test, and it's been tested a lot. Give people things to remember. Some of them take notes, some of them don't. Even if you don't get to look at the notes, you remember better because you took the notes. If you're taking notes, you have to pay attention. You can't zone out. You can't see if anything interesting is happening in Twitter. You can't see if you've had any emails in the last 30 seconds. You have to be in the meeting and therefore you're not going to miss something that turned out to be important, that it's embarrassing later not to know. You probably know that. You literally got taught to take notes right around the time you got taught to write, yeah? But here's what you may not know, especially if you don't do this. When people know that you take notes, then people who don't take notes come to you, and they say, did, did we set the deadline? for that thing, did we say the 17th? And you go to your notes and you say, yeah, looks like it was the 17th, or no, it looks like it ended up being the 21st. And they say thank you and they go away. You're becoming the expert. You may not be the person who made the decision or who's enforcing the decision or who has the power, but you know, so they come to you. They come to you for things they didn't bother writing down, but that you know. The interesting side effect of that is imagine a meeting where five things get decided, but I only care about three of them. So I write down about three of them. If anyone wants to come and say, what was the deadline, what was the budget, who's supposed to do that, I'll give them answers. The other two things, I didn't write down. If nobody else in the room cares enough to write them down either, are they going to happen? Are they going to be remembered? I mean, maybe. Some people are good rememberers, but they have a chance that maybe they're gonna evaporate. So anything that I care about enough to write down gains importance because it was actually recorded. And one of the most important things your notes can prevent is relitigating stuff that's already been settled. 
Yes, it's a waste of time. If we argued for an hour on Monday about whether to do A or B, and people got really mad and said, well, I guess we don't care about safety in this company after all, and we finally chose A, and then four days later, someone's like, I don't understand, are we doing A or B? And then we have the same arguments again. Here's the thing. The people who lost are going to argue more strongly the second time because they see a chance to get that wrong decision overturned. So they're going to use even more emotional words, they're going to be much more upset themselves, and they're really going to push hard. And the people who won are going to push back hard in response to that heightened emotion. This is where kind of those grudges, where those two people can't be in the same room, or at least not without a companion. I was on a project where one of my duties was to make sure that we'll call them Bill and Steve, that's not their names, were never alone together. And, and I was literally in a meeting and somebody came in and said, Bill and Steve are both in the server room. And I had to get up and go to the server room so that they were not alone together. It comes from this sort of thing, from going back over things that were already settled. If the company sticks to the original decision, the people who lost the first time feel much, much worse the second time. They went through all that again, they thought they had a chance, but nope, they're just ground under the heel of not caring about safety or not caring about money or whatever it is they think people don't care about. Of course, if you change the decision, it's terrible now, everyone's going to relitigate everything every chance they get. And a really simple, yeah, we talked about this last Monday, it's going to be A, just cuts all that off at the pass. Now, if you are a member of what I'm trying now to learn to call historically excluded people, also known as underrepresented people, but it's not accidental that we're underrepresented in this industry. Taking notes can be kind of office housework that gets put on ex historically excluded people. Uh, I was small for my age and young for my grade. I was two years younger than my classmates and uh, also a foreigner, so I didn't know how baseball worked at all. So when we were doing baseball in gym, rather than you know throw the ball, catch the ball, hit the ball, or run, none of which I was really capable of doing, uh, I was the scorekeeper. Right? I just wrote down what everybody else did. Do not be that. Do not sit to one side writing down what the important people are saying. This is not that at all. This is you're one of the important people. Remember what I said about if you happen to write it down, it becomes real. There will be a moment in a lot of meetings where you will have your pen or your fingers over your keyboard and say, are we saying the 17th? I'm kind of hearing a consensus for the 17th. And at the moment that you write down that the deadline is the 17th, the decision is made, right? That's power. There's a lot of power in being that kind of note taker. So you're not a secretary. You're a decider. When you work alone, you take notes for an entirely different set of reasons. The meeting notes, they could be in a wiki, they could be somewhere public, or they could be on your laptop, doesn't matter. But the notes when you work alone are just for you. They're not a service to other people. And what I find so useful for me, I'm constantly exploring new things, trying to get up to speed on things. I don't know what details I will need later, so I have a very, very lightweight technique to gather those details. So I started at 302. Here are the settings I chose. Here's a quick screenshot of that dialogue. This was fine, expected that, 13, good, fine. I clicked next, this happened, this happened. Full screen screenshot, so they got the clock in the bottom so you know what time it is. And then, oh, boom, I did not expect to see this number or this error message record what the error message is. Now you can figure out how long things took, when things went bad. You don't know what information you're going to need, but when you need it, you have it. And my inspiration for this is the scientific notebooks. I did engineering as an undergraduate in the late 70s and early 80s, and you know we were given literally paper books, bound books, to take notes in. You couldn't add pages to them, and you weren't supposed to tear pages out of them, and you're supposed to work exclusively in pen, date every page. If you leave a half a page blank, draw a vertical line down it. Many of you may have at least seen people working under those sets of rules. And those are the rules that I apply to my electronic notes, and I don't write a vertical line to indicate I left the rest of the page blank. But this idea that you don't go back and edit, you don't go back and take things out, it's a 
mutab an immutable record of what happened. So I, maybe I'm investigating a bug. Maybe I'm starting a spike to prove something can be done that we can't do for real for months, but I need to know if it's going to be a problem now, so I'm going to do a quick little spike. Or maybe we have to add 20 of something, and I'm going to take super detailed notes while I add one, and then I can use those notes to write the instructions for how to add the other 19. Very, very lightweight. So for me, I'm on a Windows machine. The easiest thing is a Word document that I can paste screenshots into. I can paste pieces of code out of the IDE. I can paste text from chat windows or emails. Very little thinking. Don't stop to think about whether you should include it or not. Include it. Disk space is cheap. And if you go off on a page and a half of exploration or 10 pages of exploration and then go, oh, I was pointed at production. Of course, I'm not seeing any results of the stuff I pushed to staging. You don't delete all that. You just write. I was pointed at production. And you back up and you start again from where you were. This is also where I put code. If you've seen some of my other talks, you know I don't like common dead out code. I don't like if deft out code. I think it's often a sign of timidity or fear. You don't trust your source control. You don't trust some of the other ways you could get the code back. Putting code in here lets you add notes about why you're removing it, why you're sure it's not needed. And it's probably going to be easier to find in these notes than in the source control if it turns out you do need it back. And for me, because I'll go on a project, and I'll work on it for a while, and then we'll be blocked. Like, oh, turns out your API does not do what you say it does. Here are absolutely incontroversial proof that your documentation is wrong and your API is broken. Well, partners, especially government partners, tend to say things like, well, we'll get back to you. And uh, then six weeks or eight weeks or six months later, they fix their API and your project can unstick. So I'm always picking things up that I had set down. But you set things down for the weekend, you know? And having these detailed notes lets you find exactly what you were doing, what the problem was, what you were trying to fix. I just recently switched to a new laptop. And all the notes I took every time I set my old laptop up for a new project have been so useful to get the new laptop set up with all the stuff that you have to build and what flags you pass and all of that, uh, simply because I fought my way through that once, but I took detailed notes. And every time I do a talk, within five or 10 minutes of coming off stage, I write a next time in the same folder as the PowerPoint, which is like things I need to add for next time. So you. Mostly use these notes literally the same day you made them. You're doing your debugging, screenshots, words, blah, 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 blah. Bug happens, look back up. I need that information. That's the number one use of it. But they are handy, especially after a gap, to say, do I sign on to this with my ID or do I have to use the special QA ID? Uh, where is the documentation? Those sorts of things. <coughs> I mentioned writing up instructions out of these raw rough, messy notes to make nice, smooth, smooth, streamlined instructions for how to do something. I've also used them for like, well, I have some notes from three years ago when we were on a different OS. You can see what it looked like then. Very often, uh, I'm the only one who has any screenshots of the system actually running and being used because I just, you know, like a, like a hobbit, I just accumulate the screenshots, but you never know when they might be useful. But you know, the other thing is, especially uh, on a project in trouble, there's a lot of people pointing fingers at each other. And sometimes people say, why did that take three weeks? Oh, let me show you. Let me show you exactly what happened and what failed and what was wrong and who I talked to and what they did about it. And here are the emails that went back and forth. They were a very useful set of information to have handy. Sometimes it can get positively adversarial. Uh, I've been an expert witness where I went through commit logs Alone in a lawyer's office on an air-gapped computer, literally only allowed to bring a pad of paper and a pen. Uh, going through commit logs to try to establish whether or not a particular feature was spontaneously invented by the people committing it. You know, you'd see a couple good things, and then they had to roll something back, and a couple good things. Or whether it had been pasted in holus bolus from the uh, cl claimant. <laughs> uh, sometimes there is a lawyer around when you're explaining how something went down. And the more detailed your notes are, and the more adamant you are that, no, sir, I never edit my documents after the fact. These are the notes I took then, and they haven't been touched since. There may be days that's really helpful. Now, 
it may be once or twice your whole career, and it's a story you get to tell. 99% of the time, it's like, wait, did I say verbose? Because if I said verbose, I should be seeing something here, and I'm not. And you scroll up and say, yeah, I did say verbose, so it's an error that I'm not. I think as developers, we pride ourselves on seeing patterns and recognizing connections. So that's important, that's a skill we should have. And then I say, yeah, like the connections between people. And then you say, no, not like that. I did a talk earlier this year about gaming and the idea that when you play a game, there's, there's an alliance or a league or a tribe or a clan or something, and you can like give people in your alliance items or gold or points without giving up anything yourself. You just push the button and the game gives them something. And I said, are your coworkers, metaphorically speaking, in your alliance? Do you do that at work? Do you just do nice things for people that cost you nothing? Most people didn't seem to feel their coworkers were in their alliance, and they didn't seem to feel that it'd be great to do something nice for them out of the blue. But think about it. Because if you're gonna go to the person at the Nest desk or to the person in the chat window and ask them how to do something, ask them to recommend a library, let's say, um, you want to know that they're going to be nice about it. They're not going to tease you for the next six weeks about how you didn't know how to do this really simple thing that everyone knows how to do. Right? You want uh, warm, welcoming, helpful. I'm really proud of what Include has put together. That's a URL. It doesn't look like one because so they're not very decorated. Um, for C++ specifically, where no one's allowed to mock people for not knowing things. You just answer the question as asked. But of course, connecting with other people is not just like transactional, how can I get help figuring out how to parse this difficult thing. Uh, it's good to actually have friends. It's just, just a tip, grandmotherly tip. Uh, you'll be happy if you have friends. I've discovered, and I can't, I can't disprove it, I wish it weren't true, but sometimes people ask me to do something to help them, as a favor to them. They need help, they need support, so I do it. And then it's amazing and great, and I'm so glad I did it. And it keeps happening to me. So the more people you have that you care about, the more people may ask you to help them do something that it may turn out that you enjoy a tremendous amount and would not have done if it wasn't to help this person. There's really nothing nicer than being shoulder to shoulder with someone, moving forward and achieving on something pretty difficult that you both really, really want to do. It is more fun than doing that alone and being a star alone. So have the opportunity to work with people and experience that. You don't want to miss on it. This is a talk by Sean Parent. I'm pretty on the record about Sean's 2013, 2014 talk, C++ Seasoning, which literally changed my life and I think changed our industry. This talk is from 2018, and not many people saw it in person because it was in Australia, but it's easy enough to find online. It has a very generic title, forgive me, generic programming, and on the surface of it, it's like, how did we end up with the STL? Why is the STL the way it is? And if you're a C++ programmer, you should watch it for that. But no matter what you work in, you should watch it, and if you're a C++ programmer, you should watch it again for the people story. Because over and over, Sean says, and then A, who had worked with B at C, came and suggested that they go to D and da 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 da. And you see this web of people who trust each other, people who have each other's backs, people who say, sure, you're not perfect, but I can get you the support you need for that part. And what created out of that trust and out of those relationships. And this is a decades long story that is very much worth listening to. And it will introduce you to a pile of people in our industry that you have not heard of, but you should have. It's a great talk. But you're probably more comfortable with connections between things that happen, right? With spotting those patterns. Hey, I remember we had this three years ago and it was a memory leak. Or, huh, it's only the odd ones that are wrong, right? Or it's only wrong in leap years. Or it's only wrong one before a power of two. That kind of pattern is super useful to be able to spot. When we would take on new projects in my consulting firm, I would very often tell the staff, this is just like some project from a year or two ago, except 
it's JSON instead of XML, you know, or whatever. The problem with spotting these things, noticing these things, is that our brains are weird and they jump up and tell you this like while you're in the shower. Uh, so have a way to be open to this information from your subconscious and to record it somehow. Back in the day, in the 80s, I would phone my desk from home and I would leave myself a voicemail. And I'd come back into work the next morning and there'd be a flashing light on my desk and I'd be like, who, who phones me? You know, oh, it's me. Oh, thank you, me. And then I could, I could act on the note. Because the cool thing about recording this in some way is then you can forget about it, but it's there for you. Uh, I, these days I Skype my partner. We're scratch pads for each other, but there are lots of ways that you can capture these fleeting things so that they're there for you when you need them. However, we sometimes go too far the other way. I have two grandchildren now. They are six and about to be two. And they go through this thing. They meet a cat. Someone says to them, that's a cat. Like, excellent. A couple weeks later, they meet another cat. Someone says, that's a cat. They say, nope. No, I met a cat. That was not it. No, these are both cats. Oh, okay. Now, this cat is called Sooty, and this cat is called Midnight or whatever. Okay, cool. You know, and then they meet like a completely other animal, and they call it a cat. Right? Uh, they call everything with four legs a cat or a dog. Or uh, one of my granddaughters, <coughs> who doesn't meet a lot of dogs, but who lives in an area where there are horse and buggies, saw a large dog and said, oh, the horse is on the bed. Um, not everything with four legs is a horse or a dog or a cat. And a lot of times, one place we overgeneralize is that if something happens to us, we think it is about us. Right? So if someone is rude to us, we think they're rude to me, that's about me, and it's probably because of something about me. No, some people are just rude. It's not about you at all. Uh, they're having a tough day, they have an ill family member, they're, they're going to have their house foreclosed, who knows, they just got fired. That's what they're being. Even if someone was fine until I showed up and then they realized, oh, it's a woman, I don't like women, they're still not being rude because I'm a woman. They're being rude because they're sexist. That's them, it's not me. Just because it was a memory leak last time doesn't mean it's a memory leak this time. Go ahead and chase that for a while, but your patterns are not always 100% true. And you should always check, especially when checking is cheap. Like, is it plugged in? I mean, come on. How long have I been in this industry? I can't believe you're asking me. You think I would call you without checking first? Oh, thanks. It happens. It happens to all of us. I mean, that's not always the problem. My, my brother-in-law had a really intractable printer problem once, and it turns out he had two bad printer cables. <sighs> but check. Is it plugged in? And check that people are okay with what you're doing. Yes, obviously, like, if you're in a romantic relationship, you want to put your arm around someone, you need to check. But, like... I was on a, a meeting, two people were really mad at each other because one of them had put the other one on the agenda for next week. So A is going to talk about B. But they didn't ask A, hey, you want to talk about B at next week's meeting? And A's position was like, you're not my boss. You don't assign me tasks. You don't put me on the agenda. It would have taken 15 seconds to check, right? And if the person's good with it, which is what you're saying, when you don't check, you're like, she'll be fine with it, He'll be, he won't mind. Okay, then asking will take that long, right? You wanna do this? Yes, good, we're done, move on. Didn't take any time at all. But if they're not, okay, oh, the disasters you avert by checking. Okay, so the quicker it is to check, the more you gotta check and don't assume it'll be fine. So I come in on projects, I don't know anything about the team, I don't think about the project. I don't really know what the problem is, other than maybe someone told me right away that Steve and Bill aren't allowed in the same room together. And I ask, and I'm going to share some of my questions with you because these questions make a world of difference. Both in my personal life and in my business life, people often say to me, some days I just want to throw it all out and rewrite it in Rust. Some days, I just want to stop writing programs and keep goats. 
Uh, some days I want to leave my husband of 50 years. This is something that was actually told to me by somebody who'd been married for over 50 years, told me she wanted to leave her husband. The thing to know is, when they start the sentence, some days I just want to, they do not intend to do the thing. Okay? So if you very seriously tell them the drawbacks of rust for this project, you're not listening to what they're really saying. Because they're not going to rewrite it in rust. I say, what would be different if you did? And they tell me. And then if I can solve that problem without them having to leave their husband or become a goat farmer or rewrite it in rust, then I'm the hero. And very often I can because they told me what the problem was. Other times people will have this big litany. We were supposed to have this. We were supposed to have that. Somebody should have given us this. A bunch of things that haven't happened. And I'll ask, why hasn't that happened yet? And the yet is so important. There's a good chance that someone in the room was supposed to have done the thing. So if you just say, why hasn't that happened? That's an adversary. When you say, why hasn't that happened yet? You're like, we all know it's gonna happen. It's been delayed, I'm curious about why. We're all on the same team. And then they tell you why it hasn't happened yet. It's a very powerful little word. In the same spirit, what's keeping this from moving forward? Like we all know what it needs to happen next but it's not happening. Why? Well, we don't have the sample data, or we haven't been given the file format, or the credentials haven't been set up. You wouldn't believe the reasons why things have been delayed for six months sometimes. I was in a meeting where someone said, well, it's not gone forward because no one's filled out form, you know, one, two, three, slash, four, five. And uh, who's supposed to do that? He is. He's right in the room. Well, why haven't you filled it out? No one told me we needed a form. Months, months of delay. So, very powerful question, if enough people are in the room. Sometimes two people are dominating or three people are dominating the whole conversation, and I'll turn to someone who's not talking and I'll say, what do you think about this? It needs to be a really open-ended question. You can't put them on the spot with a yes or no question, like, do you support that plan? Really open-ended question. They may say, what I think about this is it's got nothing to do with me, it's an ops problem, I'm just here so I don't get fined. Um, but they may have quite a lot to say, and the more open-ended your question is in that case, uh, the more likely they really will come something out. When we say, why hasn't that happened yet? Sometimes there's a, there's a really unavoidable reason. Like the person who was supposed to do it doesn't work here anymore. Sometimes they literally got hit by a bus. In those circumstances, it doesn't matter who was supposed to do it. It matters who was supposed to make sure it happens. And that's a different person. And sometimes really surfacing who was supposed to make sure something happened is the first step to that person then doing their job and making sure it happens. Sometimes people do things that are a little bit destructive. They cancel something that had been running for 12 hours. <clears throat> they delete something. They overwrite something. Everyone's upset. Everyone wants to know how to react to the problem. But I make sure to ask, what did you think that would fix? Because people don't just randomly cancel things, right? They canceled it because they thought it was stuck and they wanted to start it over. They have a reason for what they did and they need to be able to share it, both emotionally but also, like technically, we need to know what was going on. Why was that running for so long that you thought canceling it was the right thing to do? This is not at all the same as what were you thinking? It's a different question that will not get you an answer. Sometimes I ask, what's the worst that could happen? And I don't mean like YOLO, let's just go. I literally mean, if we don't fix this, where do we end up? Like, are people gonna die? Is the company gonna collapse? How bad could it be? Because the people who know that are often forbidden to say that by their colleagues. When they start saying, if we can't get this back up in another day, this thing over here is going to time out and then the reconnection and blah, blah, blah. And people don't let them talk. Don't talk that way. We'll get it fixed. Well, what if we don't? So let them tell us the worst that could possibly happen and then ask, so what do we need to change to prevent that? Engineers are really terrible about knowing the consequences of the thing they're all worked up about. You know, sometimes they're dying of embarrassment uh, because there's a spelling mistake on a page. A spelling mistake is embarrassing, but a number mistake on an invoice is costing money, right? So asking if things are costing money can clarify a lot. 
And sometimes people are being cautious, they're being timid, they're like, wait, we should wait and see, maybe we'll deal with this on Monday. And understanding what they're costing the company by not doing anything is also very enlightening. A lot of times I ask people a question and they say, I don't know. Usually, they don't know. But sometimes, they don't want to answer. They don't want to help me. They're not in a good place. And I used to say, well, can you find out? Well, that's the worst possible thing, because you know what they say? Sure, and then they leave the room. And they might come back with the answer in a week, or never. You've lost all control. Now I say, how would I find out? Often, because people like to be helpful and they like to show off, they tell you. Well, we do have a query that's got most of what you need. You could adapt it to join over to the international stuff, and then think if you filtered by status, and they, like, you don't need to write it down, it's fine, let them talk. Most of the time, someone else in the room then says, it sounds like you could do that, and now they're going to give you your answer. Oh, and this one, this is probably the most important one. I learned this with my kids. When your kids are old enough to be in a different room from you, and suddenly there's a crash. There's some screaming, maybe a, an animal is yelping, there's a lot more yelling, and you're running full speed. And you get there, something's broken, something's on the floor, maybe someone's bleeding, a lot of people are yelling, and you have a lot of questions, right? Who did that? Who opened that? What did I tell you about putting that up there? But the most important first question is, are you okay? Then your kids know that they matter. And even if no one's hurt, like if I told you a thousand times not to go up on there, and you told me it would be fine, I love this, my, my six-year-old the other day told me, oh, I can go on the roof, I promise I won't fall off. Well, that's clearly binding. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Uh, it may be if I was your mother, but I'm your grandmother, you're not going on the roof. Uh, but if you start with, are you okay, then even the person who's done wrong, who knows they did wrong, who's experienced the consequence that you predicted, that makes them very not okay. They need a minute but it's also true at work. If someone comes and says that they deleted something, that they were trying to cancel something in test, but they canceled it in production, that, that they've merged something they shouldn't merge, whatever, some irreversible thing, you're gonna have to deal with it. But if you start with, are you okay? You're going to have a much better relationship and probably solve the problem faster too. So those are all great questions. I hope you use some of them, but wait, wait till I tell you the superpower part. Sure, use them with people, use them in meetings, one-on-one, -on -one. put them in documents and ask people to write them, put them in emails. But here's the weird thing, they work on you. You can ask yourself these questions. Answer out loud. Find some place where no one else can hear you and ask yourself, what did you think that would fix? And then listen when you answer you will surprise yourself. People surprise themselves when they answer me. They tell me things they didn't know they knew. But you can tell yourself things you didn't know you knew. It's an absolutely a superpower. I talked about a guiding star. That's what your goals can be. You can call them a, a vision, a mission, whatever you like. You're gonna retire at age 50. You're going to have a super yacht. Uh, you're going to be famous in your industry. You're going to make this project come in on time and ship when it was supposed to ship. Goals get you where you want to be. You don't automatically reach every goal you set for yourself, but you are more likely to reach it if you have a goal. And it makes choices so much simpler. Should I do A or B? Well, which one leads to the lake house? Or which one gets this project shipping on time? Things get really interesting when you don't immediately do that thing. Because that reveals another goal that you're not super aware of. You have competing goals, and you need a moment of introspection to understand that. So you're offered a great promotion. Why aren't you taking it? I'd have to move to this other city. And that's got family consequences for me. Okay, so you got some more goals that you didn't know about. That's good. Sometimes you're just nervous. You think about it, you think, no, I'm just scared a little bit. Okay, that's cool. That's different. 
This is also how you set your priorities. There's hundreds of things you could be doing in any given moment. You need to ignore most of those things and focus on your priorities, which are not necessarily anyone else's. So if you think from being a programmer point of view, I'm really irritated when I meet people who always write super high performance code no matter what. It's like, this is, this is a little utility that we run once a month, you know, and it's no big deal. It can be slow. It needs to be readable. It needs to be maintainable. Someone else has to be able to take over it when you're gone. These formats change all the time. There needs to be a way to change the formats. People who are like, I don't use. Uh, <laughs> I don't use exceptions. I don't use templates. I don't use this. I don't use that ever for anything, no matter what. Because, well, in 1983, I was using a hash map and this awful thing happened. So that's that, dead to me. Most importantly, to feel okay after making a choice, to not constantly fuss and worry and go back. You have a goal, you chose the thing that moves towards the goal, yep, it lets some other things down, that's how life works, and you're okay. So you need to know your goals and kind of keep them front and center, which is okay if it's a work goal, but people feel sometimes they're a little bit embarrassing or cringe, like to have a sticky in your office that says, ship by December 31st. Well, that's the plan. Yeah, why are you reminding yourself about it? Do you think we might not? And personal goals can really feel like they're a little bit too personal to share. So uh, a tip I know that several people do is to have your desktop backgrounds kind of encode your goals. Right, so you have a goal about saving enough money to buy a lake house, a picture of a lake. No house, just the lake, to remind you you need the lake house. Uh, maybe a, a calendar pinned up with a date circled to remind you about an important date, things like that. But you want to refer to them as you're making your choices. And it's really important, and this is especially true outside of the work context, that you are supporting your goals, not someone else's. This is a tweet from earlier uh, this year. Pursuing other people's dreams earns approval. Right? Imagine you're a child, your parents make you take piano lessons, and you're good at it, and you, you win awards, and you earn certificates and things. They approve the heck out of you. And you're a young adult, and you're still doing piano lessons and still doing the certifications. Everybody is approving the heck out of you. Or you have family members who really like flashy displays of consumer expenditures, like a very expensive car or uh, $1,000 shoes. And if you chase those things, those people are going to approve the heck out of you. Yep, that's my niece. Those shoes cost $1,000, you know. But if you don't value those things, that's just misery and regret and even resentment about what you could have been doing with your time. So you want to be aligned with your values to reach your goals. I've had to write a few eulogies. I recommend you try writing your own. Not for tomorrow, not for who you've gotten to be so far. Look ahead. You're 90 or 100, okay? Where did you die? How many kids do you have? How many grandchildren do you have? What was your hobby that you were famous for? Were you a lifelong fly fisher? Or did you bake the absolutely best pies? Did you live in a small town? Did you retire somewhere? Tell me the story of how you retired. When you write all this out, you're discovering what's important to you. Then you can try to live up to it. And I mentioned those conflicting goals moments to reveal goals you weren't aware of. I meet a lot of people in their 20s, and I mean a lot, whose number one goal is to prove their father was wrong. And that's a pretty good goal for your 20s, actually. That can drive a lot of good stuff, but you do have to leave that behind at some point and get some goals that are for you. And always look for lessons, for things to learn. Whether things go well or whether things go bad, there is something to learn. I think this is probably the second most important after this should work. As a tip, if you don't feel like learning stuff, you're probably not happy. I experienced that this year. The list came out of stuff that was in 23, 
list of stuff that was going to be in 26, and I was just bitter. I was just like, I don't like any of this crap. Why do I have to learn this? What do we need that for? Jeez. Then I started doing a project that made me really happy, and I would look back at the list, and I'm like, ooh, I want to try that. It's the same list, but I was more willing to learn it when I was happier. The only thing better, taught my kids this so many times, the only thing better than learning from your own mistakes is to learn from someone else's. And their friends made lots of mistakes, and, and I had them metaphorically standing on the sidelines going, you see what they did? See what the problem with that was? See why you don't want to do that? It's excellent. But if you refuse to learn from your mistake, you know what's going to happen? You're going to make the same mistake again. You're going to keep paying for the lesson until you take the lesson. Okay? So you've made the mistake, you've suffered the pain, at least get the lesson out of it. Otherwise, it's just going to happen again. And absolutely everything you think you need to know how to do is a learned skill. Public speaking is a learned skill. Debugging is a learned skill. Software architecture is a learned skill. Nobody's born an, an anesthesiologist you know, or a trumpet player. You think like, oh, I wish I had the ability to run a meeting like that person. You can learn how to run a meeting like that person. Number one is you're wiser than you think. Most of the time, you don't listen to the little voice that's telling you what to do because you think you're not entitled to have that opinion and act on it. When you start to listen to yourself, you'll start acting wise. It helps to have ways to remember things. Naming is hard is one of my talks, and I'm often in meetings where someone will go, ah, naming is hard, because, well, it is, but it's also important. You've got to know the rest of the story, so naming is hard, let's do better, right? Sean, of course, that's a rotate. And my mother's line, better safe than sorry, which is that whole check first. It's only going to take a minute to check. Better safe than sorry. Let's do it. Let's avert that disaster. You come up with catchphrases that work for you to help connect to what you've learned. So these are the steps, you know, that I shared with you today. This should work. Observe everything around you and be able to recall it accurately, which means electronically, when the time comes. Make connections. Ask the right questions, including of yourself. Know your goals. Use those goals to drive your decision making. And always look for the learning. And those are the steps to wisdom that I have for you. Thank you.